uh, about a week or two passes they use it and then you cut off and you don't even have to say well I'm going to cut off my guard people watch and they all cut off theirs because <laughs> they are in the way anyway so what is that one modification is remove the guard the other modification is the back I guess they're stamp cut so the corners are rounded and when you're scraping the metal match you find that uh, that you can't get a good scrape with it so you sharpen that corner till it's sharp enough to give you a good scrape this one has gotten, gotten dull because it eats the living daylights if you do it with that part. The next part is you drill a hole in the handle, put a string on there, and you know the string maybe has to be about this long with a fluorescent ribbon. Then you take your knife and you throw it up in the air when there's snow. And if the ribbon, <laughs> watch carefully, because if the ribbon isn't still on the surface of the snow, that tail is not long enough. <laughs> because I would say in my career in winter camping, Dozens of knives would be lost in the snow. And when you drop a knife in the snow, I don't know what the mechanism is, but they're virtually... It's, I can't even recall anyone dropping a knife in the snow until it disappeared on them, that they did find it. You mark the spot, come back, there it is laying there on the moss in the, in the summer. But it's so easy to lose your knife in the snow. So you got that tail on there. And some people will tie a knife down when they're scared of losing it. Like, you know, canoeing or something like that. But the hazard there can be too, is you gotta be careful, is that when you got your knife tied to a lanyard, <laughs> it's like uh, a guy mm -hmm. has got this uh, Swiss Army knife and uh, I'll remind you the Swiss Army does not use that knife. That's the wrong name. The name <coughs> is, this is the knife made by the people who make knives for the Swiss Army. Because the Swiss Army does not carry a knife that we call the Swiss Army Knife. No Swiss Army soldier would, <laughs> would no respect himself for carrying <laughs> such a knife uh, in his possession. But anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so the guy's got a knife, he's got it on the lanyard and, and showing people, and it's tied to the lanyard and people are opening all the blades and then he takes a step back and the guy that's holding the knife has the knife pulled out of, mm. you know, through his hand. Mm. And the, because the, the, the main blade was open, it cut him to the bone. Uh, there. But anyway, there's a hole here, and if you put a loop in there, so the knife hangs, and the handle hangs from your wrist like that, when you're crafting a lot, or maybe even working, doing something over water, I don't know what you'd be doing over water, then you put that looper on your wrist, and when you let go of your knife, it hangs. You know, like for example, in the dark, we often would set up these canopies, and we have to put all kinds of guy ropes, and I found it was simpler to hang the knife from my wrist, cut the strings, cut them and everything, and all, and then hang it instead of looking for my sheath and then cutting and then looking for my sheath. And when I am basket weaving, I often have it hanging from my wrist under certain operations where I'm using my knife a few moments and then a few moments not, a few moments, and it hangs from my wrist and away I go. I got this idea out of a, out of a primitive. Uh, then there's a third hole. Now this here, you have the option of the three holes. Now generally I like a lanyard hole, this here particularly falling in the snow is going to bury itself deeply. And when I tie this knife to a stick, it's not to make a spear out of it, it's to have a handle like this and to use it as a sickle, especially in England, where when you look at that vegetation over there, you know you can't walk through it, there's these briars that are practically not visible and they will probably keep you from moving because they'll grab your clothes. And if your clothing isn't stick, stiff enough, it'll gump onto your clothing. It's like that prickly ash in Minnesota. You've got to watch what you're doing. You don't run around the bush like we do because the prickly ash will rip you right to the, rip your skin off on your shoulders and so on if you happen to hit one of those and so on. Well, anyway, and you'll be walking along a path and there'll be this briars and they're mixed in with that balsam and stuff. You can't go through there unless you cut it. If you don't have a machete, you're going to have a long time trying to cut it. You know, if you put a handle on it like this and you whip your way through there in minutes and you're off to the other side because you chopped all those wires into little chunks because you put a handle like that on the, on the end of the knife. And when you're making the cutting grass for thatching and everything, it's kind of awkward. Grab a handful, cut it, grab a handful. But put a longer handle on it, you might find you could get pretty good at sickling off large amounts by the fact that you can go through that glass so much faster with your knife. Mm -hmm. 
and then there's a hole in the bank. And that we charge extra to tell anybody there's a secret. <laughs> that there was no secrets. Huh? That there was no secrets. That was the day one. <laughs> I thought you said there was no secrets. Now we're yeah, you know, that was day one, right? Day two, now the secrets. Yeah. I remember saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at trade shows, uh, now people will think I designed that night, but I really didn't. Uh, Rod Garcia from Whitefish, Montana. He took the seven day course. I think twice in the winter and twice in the summer. And then whenever we have uh, the uh, annual event, it's advertised, I think, in your notes, the Rat Root Rendezvous. Every second Rat Root Rendezvous, he shows up. Uh, now, Rod was a house painter. You can tell house painters quite often.